Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. We are at Gibson with the legendary Tom Murphy. Thanks so much for sitting down with us today. It's great sure. to uh, great to spend some time with you. We've been talking about guitars for a while. Very cool mm -hmm. stuff. I do that. Yeah, and I think we've got a few here we're going to talk about today too. Yes. Yeah. Very exciting. So you've got this whole Murphy Lab thing going on yes. here with Gibson that's been just a tremendous success. And of course, at Sweetwater, we love those guitars, and uh, I do personally as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about how, I mean, I, I don't know if people know that you're a player, that you're out there playing the instruments. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, heard a story about you kind of getting into this because of seeing uh, Pearly Gates on, well, on stage oh, yes. somewhere. Is that right? Yeah, when I was 19, I was living in Houston. And we went to see this new band. We'd heard Billy Gibbons had this band. And I'm sitting on the floor 10 feet from the stage and he walks out from behind his marshal with this Les Paul. And I've told him before that I remember what he was wearing, his boots his, and that Les Paul. And then all these years later, I'm in Houston and they're getting that guitar out so I can take measurements off of it. <laughs> and if you'd have told me that when I was 19 that I, that would happen, Right. It's crazy. So there have been so, so many great experiences through the aging and now, of course, the lab and, and dealing with artists. And it's still just about the guitars, passion for the guitars. Right, right. So how did you get started back in the day with the whole idea of aging the guitars and, and creating those effects? Well, I have old guitars and I have been obsessed with staring at them, wondering how things happen to them. I have been really intrigued with the finishes in general, mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of a sunburst. Uh, TV yellow was just a mystery for a long time. Uh, my first day at Gibson, one, an employee that I heard had been in Kalamazoo was walking in, an older gentleman, and I just introduced myself and I asked him if he knew how they did the TV yellow finish. He was in the parts department, so <laughs> in, in, anyway. Uh, through a couple years later, in, in a p capacity that I was working in where I was painting, I had probably four versions of TV Yellow, and literally one night in bed, it came to me. And TV Yellow, in a sort of technical sense, is inside out. Hmm. You tr tr try to fill the grain on mahogany so it will level out. In TV Yellow, you paint it with it not filled and you exposes the holes in the grain, which you then put uh, like a glaze, and that contrasts the, the, the grain against the color. Mm -hmm. And of course, in my younger years, it looked like people's furniture. Right. And some, some of us sort of thought it meant it looked like your grandmother's TV, <laughs> when in reality, <laughs> there's talk of it, it showed on, on TV better or mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, just the whole intrigue and, and interest in the finishes and then restoring guitars. I couldn't just stop at refinishing an old guitar, especially a neck to an original body. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually, I had a 55 Les Paul Jr. that fell off the strap and hit a monitor and put a dent in the back of the neck. And I tried to steam that dent out with an iron because I'd heard about that. And that small spot got about that big by both the next several months of me messing with it with no idea how to repair it, how to colorize it. And eventually I, I did, and then I have this new spot of lacquer and all these other weather checks. That's the first guitar I ever tried to simulate the checking on. And then a Firebird, full re headstock repair on a Firebird, a gold Firebird. Uh, really got me involved because they're it's all shiny and new. The rest of the guitar was really, really, really checked. And I could sort of simulate the pattern because they were so straight and small loops. Mm -hmm. And that one has got people's attention when I returned it to the owner with people going, wow. And with me going, uh, I can't tell you how I did that. Right. But I knew I had something. Uh -huh. And uh, so that that's where the idea of the simulated checking really was born. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the historic instruments were a real inspiration because they will carry that treatment so well, especially now with the lab. Uh, and I just, I knew people 
I have guys ask me, how can I make the guitar not so shiny? How can I, what can I do? So in uh, 97, I took my actual historic Les Paul, completely stripped it, redid the entire finish with an anilin die on the back, aged the hardware, and put it on display with no plan at an Arlington guitar show. And that's when everything changed because guys were going, you can do that? Yeah, and I had to come up with a price. Right. <laughs> and uh, they, they just started coming to my shop in Illinois. And then historic dealers got involved where they wanted me to do groups of them. And uh, actually, Gibson and I started talking again. And uh, the rest is history, historic. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, then we, we pretty quickly got involved with artists. And I was, telling you earlier about Dickie Betts and then Gary Rosington and, of course, Jimmy pa uh, Page. Uh, oh, gosh, how, how, where do we go? Uh, Mike Bloomfield and the Eric Clapton thing, the Beano thing, and Dwayne's guitar, and the list just goes on and on. Joe Walsh and Joe Perry, and, 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 and we're still doing that today. Right. But I'd like to say that uh, with the lab and the, the lab treatment, uh, the guitars, it, the, it's a major upgrade for me taking a razor blade. Yeah. You know what I mean. Right. So it's just still really exciting. So the techniques continue to evolve. You yeah. Find yeah. new ways to do things, new yeah, ways I, to do old things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The past is the future or whatever. Right. Uh, I've been really, really lucky to experience and sometimes stumble on uh, techniques and, and materials. Uh, to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's never been, to me, as, as authentic and legitimate as it is now out of the lab. Right. And uh, I, I will say the lab process was my idea, and I took it to them because I was gonna keep it for myself. I thought, well, that's silly. Let's do it together. They can help me and I can help them, and so that's where we're at. Right, right. So is it a, a different kind of an approach when you're recreating a famous artist instrument versus one of the, I guess we'll say, stock? A stock core product. Right. Uh, slightly. Uh, I've engineered the four levels. Uh, most people know we have four levels, ultra light, light, heavy, and ultra heavy. That's the spectrum of conditions you see old guitars in. And I've seen them by reproducing artists, collector guitars, restoration. And so I said, can we have a menu so that we don't depend so much on someone bringing the car and we got to copy it? Mm -hmm. We'll always do artist projects, of course. And with that, you have that reference. That's your reference point. With our core, I just had to come up with some generic versions of each level. Mm -hmm. And our ultralight has no scratches, dings, dents, per se. Looks like a guitar could have been left in a case for 50 years, but it has weather checking and lightly aged hardware. The, right. the light aged shows playing wear, not too damaged, but it's not pristine. Heavy has paint missing on the back, and then ultra heavy has extreme belt wear and arm wear and, and dings. Those are just representations of, like I said, things we've seen. But right. an artist guitar gives you a reference and a pattern, and you m even make templates from it you have to have a consistency. It gets a little cookie cutter, sorta. Mm -hmm. That's the way you do it. Sure. They all—they all got to be the same. So, it, it's fun uh, uh, engineering those projects too, and maintain a consistency throughout. Right. So. Yeah. Do the uh, do the artists come to you, or do you go to the artists? They don't really come to Tom Murphy, but <laughs> some people at Gibson now have a lot of phone numbers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and relationships, right, and yeah, it's imagine. good. Yeah. But I will say that on every case, and any time we, I personally have had a dealing of any kind with an artist, it's about the guitar, mm -hmm. and they like guitars, and they are proud to have their guitar represented, uh, uh, reproduced, and uh, and that's a kick, and it's a kick for them too. Sure. Right. Right. So I'm curious with the core guitars, you mentioned that there's four levels. Within those four levels, are the guitars, if you buy a 
57 Les Paul Custom. Is this one going to be exactly the same as that one? Is that one, or are there variations? No among two are the there? same because there is an element we can't totally control. Mm -hmm. But they are the same in terms of what condition they are in. And yes, we have belt buckle wear templates, which I made up to, to keep each guitar in that class the same. But also, we went freehand when we can, so they're not so cookie cutter. Uh, but this heavy aged one has to look like that heavy aged one. Right. So, but there's going to be some variation just because of the yeah, natural. No, yeah, no two are going to be the same. And, and the checking, all I'll say is it's, it's real. And so we let nature take care of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just awesome to see it happen. And, yeah. and the each guitar has its personality. And, and what, what I'm excited about it is seeing guitars in the future that have come out of the lab and have been used. And uh, you'll see the experience and the results on the guitars right. as they're being played and used in real time. Right, which is so cool. It's which very so cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, yeah. You were talking about how you're very careful about it has to look like what really happens when somebody yeah. plays a guitar. On belt buckle wear, which is, everybody knows what that is. It's usually in the, generally the same location. Uh, it has to look like it was rubbed and worn off, not peeled off, which mm -hmm. then what that needs is for to have a feathered edge, soft, and we know how to do that. Our finishes are really thin to begin with, but at some point it's literally just removed from the guitar. And then we we process that edge with about three different treatments which soften it, show evidence of the damage right on the border, and then that damage sort of moves out and and I would like to get about three different textures happening there so you can't pinpoint what would have done it. It's all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And some guitars, like a Greeny, a Peter Green guitar. I mean, that guitar is so beat and worn for all, all the awesome music that was made with it in all the years uh, that uh, you, you have to really look at every square inch and, and sort of try to decide what caused that to happen. Right. And it's not just belt buckle wear, it's, it's wear and, and texture all over the back, the guitar and the, and the front. Mm -hmm. There's always a trademark thing here or there. Peter Green has a, has a, I don't know what it is, a cut, crack, something heading toward the toggle switch. Uh, that has a story, I'm sure, yeah. to it. And he, he didn't use a pit guard, so he is a pretty extreme fingernail wear between the pickups and un under the bridge pickup. So I made a template for that a long time ago. And then you have to soften the edge of that too. So, you know, it's just trying to figure tricks of how to create this stuff. Uh, I have a, a box of tools that when I pour them out on the table, it, it looks like a junk drawer. <laughs> And I can tell you what some of those things were made for, specifically. The Joe Perry guitar is worn on the, on the volume knob all the way into the maple. Hmm. I don't know how that happened, but I made a, a steel bent sharpened tool that I put on a knob and go around repeatedly. And you just have to figure out how to, how to simulate that stuff. Yeah, oh, there's a lot of creativity that goes into, besides the labor yeah, that goes into yeah. it, there's a lot of creativity that goes into I, uh, the whole process. I was in art club in high school. I wasn't really a good artist, but obviously that intrigued me. My dad was a woodworker and was meticulous about his work. And then I went, my shop in Illinois was in his wood shop. And uh, every once in a while, I'll sort of figure out why I have an interest in some aspects of the work. Mm -hmm. And I, and like, once again, I refer really to a lot of times to my own guitars. Right. Of how, how they look, why they look, headstock corners and stuff like that. Sure, right. Well, we are surrounded here by just stunning instruments. We're 
drooling over all these. Tell us about this one that's, that's right there to your right. Well, in the ultralight category, it has no aging per se in terms of a distressing, mm -hmm. but it has our exclusive finish, which provides the checking. And when you look at this guitar, whether we'll be able to see it or not, the checking is exquisite. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> and you, like a guitar in this condition, obviously wouldn't have been played, but it would continue to cure and age over time. And the lac lacquer will really get hard and brittle it, no matter what, whether mm -hmm. you're playing it or not. Uh, I also like our hardware treatment. This is a, a light age treatment on gold and our hardware aging crew, they're just really great and they work really, really hard and are limited in their chemicals and, and treatments that they do. Uh, so they're always coming up with different ways to show distressing string lines on the pickups and so on. But that's what this is. So that's the cleanest Murphy Lab guitar you'll ever see. So that's, that's the ultra age, that's ultra light ultra, age. Ultra light. Okay. While we're talking about that, mm -hmm. I want to uh, point out one of the guitars back here, which is this black 57 custom. Could somebody grab that for us? But this is actually my 57 ultralight aged Murphy Lab 57 Custom, the solid mahogany one. And uh, I, I bought this guitar because I strummed a chord on it and just absolutely fell in love. I don't yes. even know if I even plugged it in before I, before I bought it. It right. just sounds so fantastic. But I'll hand this to you. And one of the interesting things about these guitars is that it feels like it's an old guitar. But it's already even, I've had this like six weeks, uh -huh. and you can see that already some of the finish is shining in some places sure. and getting duller, and I pointed out to you there's a little scratch on the neck and things. Right. And, and so what I see this as, as kind of setting the stage for adding your own yes. wear, wear to the garage, which is so, it, uh, the garage, the guitar, which is so cool. I, I've said that here, take an age it yourself. Uh, and, and what we want to make clear to people is that the ultra light, even though it doesn't show distressing and, and age elements per se, they are going to age because of the nature of the finish. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who buy into the ultra light are buying an aged guitar. Right. Uh, so I, it's great to see this because I, I can tell it's been played. Yeah. Not damaged but it definitely doesn't look like a new guitar. Right, right. And yeah, it's really so cool. And I mean, I, I look at my guitars sometimes after a gig and go, how did, I, how did that happen? Right. Uh, and because I look at guitars mm -hmm. and other people do too. And I'm looking at this one and I guarantee you a year from now, if we look at this same guitar, it won't look like this. Yeah. And hopefully even better. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and so people buying the ultralight need to understand it, it, they won't stay perfect yeah. if you use them and play them. I mean, we considered selling a glass case to put a, <laughs> hang them on the wall if you really, that, that would just be really a shame. need that. That's a shame. That's a shame. That's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess I'll say in, in that we are not making a claim uh, formally about the sonic benefits of our finish. I mean, I can feel it right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that whole thing just resonates, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, that wasn't engineered into the plan, but as it's happening, we're not going to deny it mm -hmm. at all. And I, I hear it from other people. So that's just a plush, you know. So uh, I have been saying recently that I used to take the new guitars with a new finish and try to make them look old. And now I feel, for all intents and purposes, I'd take a new guitar and put an old finish on it. Mm -hmm. And because of the way it performs and, and to, to me, the way it feels. Right. And sounds cool. Yeah, man, I, I can't wait to, like I say, a year from now, it'll be fun to, to see where that guitar is. Well, everything happens. that happens will happen because of you. So yeah. just keep that in just mind. Just kind of set the base there and now we'll build from that. Right? Yeah, right. yeah. That's, that's very cool. I mean, uh, on our Ultra Heavy, which is extremely aged, lots of different elements and paint missing. It's pretty dang cool, but I don't know where it'll go from the consumer, what it's left for them to do to it, you know. Yeah. But it'll continue so. wearing, though. It'll continue. Uh, oh, when yeah, you yeah. play it, it's got to, it has it to, will. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So what's this guitar that's on, uh, on your right again? This is in our heavy-aged class. Uh, it's almost borderline ultra-heavy, 
What's cool about this is, is that this is actually a frost blue firebird. Mm -hmm. And lacquer turns yellow with age. And yellow and blue make green. So when you get the guitar like this, it gives you opportunity to show those dynamics of going from the yellowed lacquer back to the blue. And so when you get neck wear, for instance, that's what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. This is worn through the wood, but this is worn just to the blue paint. So it, it gives you something extra to work with a little bit. Right, right. The attention to detail is, is really stunning. And one thing that jumps out at me is like the, the, uh, the bird, bird is, is worn oh, a yeah. little bit too. Work. If, and, and on our heavy and ultra heavy Les Pauls, you'll see the silk screen to worn off a little bit on the peg head. Because uh -huh. that's what that, happens. That's what happens, yeah. Uh, but uh, especially on this guitar, I've been saying that the hardware is the first thing you see when you open the case, mm -hmm. for the most part. And they did such a killer job on here, it really sets this guitar off yeah. as looking like an old guitar. Mm -hmm. Shiny hardware on here would sort of subtract, but uh, it just makes everything sort of, sort of fit together. That's incredible. So, That's incredible. This little guy everybody falls in love with, it's a lowly little double cut junior that has been not abused, but used, mm -hmm. and uh, we love it, and I actually know someone who has, uh, as far as I know, the only known double cut black junior from 59, and uh, it doesn't look like this. This was just something I made up, uh, and uh, going back to, to the lab plan, I wanted to be able to sort of uh, engineer the levels mm -hmm. and the treatments and then uh, product development and headquarters came up with the menu of, of guitars. So we have 24 ultralights, 10 or 15 light, and then we end up with only five ultra heavies and this is one of them. We have a 335, a Les Paul in a dark burst. And, uh, oh, I can't remember now. But so this guy is in the ultra heavy category. So I just tried to think of what maybe happened. Juniors sometimes did get mistreated and never got put in a case. Right. Never got wiped off. Uh, this has a little bit of our neck wear. Uh, I've worked on it over the last year. Uh, I never want to just see a big bald spot where there was finished. So uh, this one had already been aged, and then I tried to tweak it a little bit, where we are trying to leave a textured look on whatever's left of the finish instead of just a black and then bare wood. That's a little bit of that. But you'll see it a lot more on our ultra heavy aged pieces. But that's, that's pretty typical of how a rough a junior can be. Um, so th there's something for everybody, really. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is absolutely incredible. Absolutely. And it does add so much to the realism to not have it just be, like you said, peeled the paint off or just yeah. took a, a piece of sandpaper to it or something. Yeah, and, and like you can, I don't know if the, the camera can pick it up, but this is, this is peeled off. Mm -hmm. And then it's treated on the edge, as you can see. Mm -hmm. with a feathering, you can't feel the edge of that. And then what would cause that? There had to be some damage. Well, that's what this represents. And then as it thins out, moving away from there. Uh -huh. it, it's not rocket surgery, but it's a specific objective is to create that. Right, right, that's beautiful. Once again, the hardware, awesome. Uh, the checking, if you could see it, is so intense on this guitar, which when I saw it happen, I was really pleased. Same thing with the belt buckle where there is a template for this, but then you have to work the edge and there's always gonna be some other spots, missing paint, there's gonna be missing wear right here. Uh, it just looks so real and sort of makes it comfortable to play yeah. Uh, we talked about the psychology of why, why do they feel and play so good? Because you think they do. 
Because <laughs> you're not worried about. Well, it feels, yeah. it feels like you've played it. You feel it, right. Yeah. You're, not, you're not so worried about it, right? And I will say this too about the Murphy Lab product and now actually all custom shop products. Mm -hmm. Our fingerboard line, they prep the fingerboards, they roll the binding. That's been done for a long time, but not consistently. But all Murphy Lab guitars and or custom shop guitars will have rolled binding. Mm -hmm. That means it takes that sharp edge off all along where the board meets the binding. And that usually would come with over years of playing. And uh, it, it's an, another feature of, of the product that gives you a, a vintage feel. We have here. Well, this is our ultra light uh, 59 Blonde mm -hmm. dot 335. Uh, I don't know. I guess if this was an original 59, it'd be a $75,000 guitar, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> But along with the awesome design of the guitars in the custom shop now today, the historic line and or true historic, whatever you want to call it, it's just a great playground for what we do. So this guitar has essentially an old finish with all the checking on it, no real damage yet, but you can enjoy the look of an old guitar, hopefully the feel and sound. This thing's checked throughout, fully checked, neck, back, front, sides. And if you can imagine seeing these happen mm -hmm. and seeing them put together, it's really just a real joy. Right. Yeah, the, the checking is a, a fascinating thing. Um, I first encountered it with a brand new guitar that I bought where I was, it was in the winter time and I went into a club and opened the case up oh, and sure. the finish shattered. Oh, yeah. But, uh, and that's one way it happens. Yes. But uh, I was at a friend's house here in Nashville actually two nights ago and he brought out a guitar that he had bought from someone and his dad had purchased, it was a Birdland, and he had purchased it in 80 or 81 mm -hmm. or something like that and it had been in the case ever since. He never really played it. Right. And you open the case up and that has checking in it even though it's never been ne really out right. of the house or, or anything. How does that happen? Uh, well. Essentially, checking of the lacquer on a guitar happens from expansion and contraction of the wood and the lacquer getting so brittle and uh, uh, rigid that it cannot, it won't tolerate the, the movement. And, uh, and wood will move continually. I have a really old guitar from 1953 with a maple neck that played like a dream from 1978 when I bought it. Uh, the neck is an amazing, feel straight, perfect, consistent. And in 1994, when I moved to Illinois in a house with forced air, gas heat, I pulled it out of the case and the fret ends were sticking out. Mm -hmm the neck had shrunk and the fret ends were exposed. I had never felt that before. So I had to smooth them down while the wood was there. That's, a, that, that's 50 years old and it's still moving. Right. And uh, so you have to, and I have a 52 J45 that in the winter I have to tighten the truss rod and in the summer I have to loosen it <laughs> because I'm, I'm moving frets mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, so. We have to find a way to cause that to happen. Right. And fortunately, we have, have found a way. Right, right. And uh, so the checking in general is as our foundation of the Murphy Lab product. And along with that comes the feel of an old, old finish. Right. So that's why essentially I say, we're putting an old finish on your guitar. So keep that in mind while you're playing it, handling it, uh, especially with the ultralight category, uh, be really difficult to keep that thing pristine mm -hmm. very long or forever because uh, I had someone bring a Murphy Lab light and they own a real 59 and it had a flake, a little tiny spot on the front and he admitted he'd left it in his car when it was really hot and I said, would you leave your 59 in the car? <laughs> he said, no. I said, well, you shouldn't, probably shouldn't leave the Murphy Lab right. like that either. Right. So, 
that's not a flaw, it's just a reality in the nature of the finish. Right. Yeah, you basically have a vintage finish on the, yeah, on the instrument, which yeah. is what, uh, you know, we were talking about my guitar, uh, my guitar, and uh, that's what I love about it. Is yeah, it that, that is what's going to happen to it as you That's as what you you're play. really supposed to love about it, and that's why we want everybody to know, if you buy a Murphy Lab product, a guitar, you have bought into the aged family of, of historic instruments. Right. So cool. So cool. Like I've said before that some people like would like their blue jeans to say blue, but they're not going to. And then some, <laughs> I want them faded right now. Oh, and I want the knees blown out. And one, oh, and I want them with the pocket torn off the back. We have that spectrum of, of conditions on the guitar through the Murphy Lab. Right. Man, thanks so much for sitting down with us today. This has oh, been, uh, man, I've just had so much fun hanging out with you and I, talking I, about I guitars. I love it, and I can definitely talk about guitars. Oh, man, me, me too. So, all so right. but we appreciate you sitting down with us. And, uh, Thank you guys so much. Thanks for, for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge and everything. I, I will always brag about the Murphy Lab. Right on. Well, you should. Okay. You should. And thank you for joining me, too. I'm Mitch Gallagher coming to you from Gibson in Nashville, Tennessee.